sweet. Oh. And we're done. Have a great weekend. <laughs> See ya. Crap. All right. When it does this, I have no choice. I have restart. All right. I'll start with that again. How is everyone doing? I'm like, how's school? The reason I bring it up is that I've had, as actually a number of professors have, um, students who have had some trouble just based on the emotion, the stress that everything, uh, it's not only placed on you guys as students in general, but then in the midst of a pandemic, especially those of us who have either, you know, possible health issues that could potentially lead to uh, a worse response in the event of catching COVID for people in their families who potentially have that same type of thing where if you as a student were to catch and bring out the family, then that would suck. So, I mean, there is definitely some very heavy decisions being made uh, by pretty much each of us every day when we decide to come to school and come to the setting like this. And then, of course, coupled on uh, all of our traditional stresses as students in, return, in, in regards to all the homework that is assigned to us, the number of assignments made at one time, papers, work lengths, I mean, just kind of like that um, aspect of, of our lives. And then, hey, I mean, every once in a while, we have a bad day. You know, we get in a fight with our friend or, or you know, our significant other, or just, you know, lose four, five, six, eight games in a row. Fortnite we just can't figure out why can't I get that, you know, Royale logo to pop up on the screen. That's me every day. Like, I just was constant. Um, so, in the event, that anybody has any problems. I mean, you're just stressing on that level. I've always said, I'd like to say that God gave me both big ears for a reason. Um, and it's certainly in my position as a professor, even if it's for one class, like, I really want to be open to you guys. In the event that you need someone to talk to you, just, you got to know, but, you know, maybe whatever the problem that you're facing or that you might be facing, it's just something that nobody can help you with. And maybe I, you know, I'm not saying that I can help you fix everything, but I can at least, as I reference, be in here. And if you just need to complain, if you just need to talk, if you just got to get something off your chest, you know, you can come to me, you can, we can talk before or after class, probably not before since I come from the U.S. so far away, but we can talk after class, you can always text me, um, you whatever you need. Um, so just know that whatever you might need me for, I can, you know, want to help out. If you don't need me, you know, talk to me, if you're doing good, God bless you. Praise God, you know, and I, just, I don't want any of us to, to have too much stress in our lives, but if your parents aren't listening, or maybe if they're not here, maybe they're in another state, and, you know, your friends are, you know, your professors are just dumping all the stuff on you, and you just can't get over it, and your friends are kind of equal setting, you've really just got to vent, shoot me a text, and I'll be honest, like, you know, we're not supposed to curse, but we got to curse a little bit because it feels good. So long as you're not directing it at me, unless I deserve it, well, that's totally fine too. So just um, be aware that whatever you guys need, let me know. And if you're really just like really stoked that the Suns are actually doing pretty good and you want to talk, you know, just basketball like I, you know, or you really, you, you won a little hot streak last night. You won three or four straight games of, of Fortnite. You want to let me know. Bring it on. So if anybody has anything they want to say right now, go ahead and we get moving. No? Fantastic. So when I was in college, I was a t-shirt collector of soda and food. Like I Coke, I had several Pepsis. I had that Pepsi, then I had kind of the modern Pepsi logo. Mountain Dew, which I still have. I lost all the others. I gave away, I don't even know what happened, but I still have my Mountain Dew. Dr. Pepper, Mr. Pib. Um, I was just totally a collector of that stuff. I used to drink, you guys, do you, who, who drank soda like a lot? Like admittedly, like you drink a lot of soda. Okay. I drank soda as a meal replacement when I was in college. My breakfast was very often a cherry Pepsi. My snack between classes, my meal between classes was Mountain Dew. 
I had a Coke or Dr. Pepper after dinner. I drank so much soda when I was your age, and I loved it. I mean, it tasted, it was so good, so refreshing. And, you know, the sugar and the caffeine kept me up in my lectures, and so I really dug it. But I got into my late 20s, and I'm still kind of keeping that habit up, probably a bit longer than I really should have. And it really started to mess with my stomach, and I started getting, you know, I mean, I wasn't like dying or anything, but I started to get kind of sick from all of that soda. And I cut it out cold turkey because I figured out, like, kind of the process of emotion. I was like, I'll bet you anything, so I cut out soda, and within days, I was feeling like a hundred times better. And outside of the occasional, like, sip here and there, when I say sip here and there, I probably had maybe three sips of soda in the last, like, five plus years. I haven't tried it. And, you know, I haven't drank it. And I got to tell you, after not drinking for a long time, soda's disgusting. Like, it is so gross. I can't even believe No, I, listen, you guys in particular. I would have had that exact same. I'd be like, oh, you're joking me. It's the greatest thing. No. Give it up for five years or don't. But I'm just saying, like, give it up for five plus years and then try to taste Coke. And it's just like, what was I drinking? It is awful. Now, I've moved on. I feel like my taste buds have really matured. I said it to be kind of a goofball, but I love coffee. So I drink a ton of coffee. But um, soda, though, whew, I, I, I taste it. I still, I can still like crave it. Like I'll, I'll crave a Coke still to this day. I'll crave Mountain Dew hard to this day. I just won't touch this time. So seriously, the meal replacement. That's, I literally treated a bottle of Cherry Pepsi as breakfast every day. All right, so here we are in Lecture 204 of the Power Authority and Government Series. Today we're discussing the challenging of power authority and government in world history. Um, if my math is correct, after next week, so you guys have this class and have one more in person, and we are halfway through the in-person portion of the semester. Because if you remember, our last two weeks are back on Zoom as we started. So after next week, we're already halfway through. Uh, if my math is correct, somebody might do that math for me and figure out that I'm wrong, but I'm pretty positive. Which also means we're three weeks away from being halfway through the semester. We have three classes left, including this one, before we can literally say we're, on, we're closer to the end than we are at the beginning. So we are flying by. Hopefully our last assignment will for you guys. Nobody have any complaints of this. Is there any problem with it? Hopefully it was good. So uh, hopefully things went well for you. And the reason why I bring this up, and I'll bring this up consistently, because it is because the semester is going to pretty much fly by. I think we're a week away from being halfway through the in-person classes. We don't have many in general, and now we're almost halfway through them. Um, and so if you do have a problem with your assignments, I really need you to come to me and start to figure out, or if, in particular, if you're having a problem with your grade, like your grade just isn't where you want it to be, I really need you to come to me sooner rather than later so that way we can we don't get to the point where we're at the end of the semester and you kind of just put off fixing it and then it's too late. Um, so your assignment from this week should be graded by this week. I should have that done probably by tomorrow, honestly. Um, and so you'll know then what you are to some two assignments in or three, two assignments in, plus your attendance and so forth. So like, if you haven't been doing your video attendance, uh, that's going to add up. And I, and I need to tell you again, I think I've told this class, but if I have, I'll just share it very briefly. Every single semester, I get a student that's like 12 points away from that next grade up. And it's often from a B plus to an A minus, or from an A minus to an A. And they just, they really want those, those points. And there's, and is there anything I do? Everything's been turned, is there anything I do? No. You know, and what is generally the case is students will miss four, or five, six classes. It's like, okay, you're paying for class. I mean, I can't force you to be here. Nobody can force you to be here. But especially when it comes to online stuff, where I'm sure it feels even easier to miss them in person. When you're, you know, when you're missing four, or five, six classes, that is 20 to 30 points right there that if you just showed up or sat down at your desk and took notes, you would have had that would have bumped you up from that A minus to an A or C plus to B minus, all of which helps your GPA. So just be aware again as we push through. We're, we're this close to being halfway done. I mean, that's, that's really the key point to keep in mind. We're this close to being halfway done. But also, you know, your attendance, both online and in person, is extraordinarily important. So if you get to the end of the semester, again, you're going to turn in everything, and you look at your grade, and you're like, man, I am 20 points away. Is there anything I can do? Can we go back and fix it? But I can't. And you also missed eight classes throughout the semester. There was your 20 points. And in fact, there was 40 points. That could have maybe taken you up two grade levels, potentially. Uh, so just, just be aware of all that. So any questions, comments, turn space, pushes on that front. All right, we're feeling good, though. Hopefully everybody is feeling good. We're not, nobody should be too far behind. I mean, we should be able to catch up right quick. Oh, no. Why is this not one? Okay. Today we're going to describe the evolution 
of the sources of political legitimacy. So if you watched the video on Tuesday and sent me a notes, you'll know that we discussed the sources and identified the sources of political legitimacy, of which there are five primary. Today we're going to discuss the evolution of. Um, let's skip this. I'm going to skip this to save us a little bit of time, because uh, I should be able to answer all of these within the lecture. All right, so what we need to know about absolutism, absolutism is the idea that government must, for government to be legitimate, it must be absolute. There cannot be competing governments. Um, so a kind of quasi example that at least ties in modern history is that of the election of Biden and Trump. And that period of about a month where Trump was really pushing and, and a lot of people were really pushing, this is illegitimate, this is illegitimate, this was, this was stolen, you know, they're, you know, look at look the numbers, look at the, the spikes. I mean, we all saw the, the videos, blah, 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 all that stuff. And so what could have been argued during that period, can't be argued anymore, and I'll explain why very quickly. What could have been argued at that, at that point was that Biden's presidency was going to be illegitimate because there was enough evidence to prove its illegitimacy in his election, that Trump truly had won. Now, the reason it cannot be seen as illegitimate anymore is because there has been nothing set for There hasn't been a single state that flipped, that went, oh, wow, we really did have 20,000 too many Biden votes, uh, which meant Trump did win the state. Or, oh, wow, we really did recognize that so many tens of thousands of votes were falsified, which flips that state. Since that didn't happen, Trump's got nothing. And one can argue that while they were, you know, the, the judges, the courts, the state legislatures, the governors, they were trying to try to hold them back. Maybe. I'm not going to, that, that's not the point I'm trying to make. The point was at this point, Biden is as legitimate as Trump was as president, as legitimate as Obama was as president, because they are the absolute. They are the one. There is no other competing government. And so what that is what absolution is, absolution is in government. And so it's thinking back to the days of the monarchy, it was that there was an absolute monarch. It was one. It was one power. It was one authority. It all fell on them. So that's what that idea and definition comes from. Now, our first, what say you, however, social distance talk to your neighbors, is selfishness evil? Is selfishness evil? So here are two, I forget the dictionary I got it from, but here are two dictionary definitions. Def the definition of evil is morally reprehensible, sinful, wicked, and evil impulse. Um, and arising from actual or imputed bad character or conduct of a person. So that's the definition of evil. The definition of selfish is concerned excessively or exclusively with oneself, seeking or concentrating on one's own advantage, pleasure, or well-being without regard for others, and arising from concern with one's own welfare or advantage in disregard. Of others. So, is selfishness evil? Socially distanced talk to your neighbors. Right, set, go. Yeah. 
Let's do it right now. These are going to be your placards. I just, I don't know many names. So please fold these hot dog, not hamburger. So lengthwise, not widthwise. And write your name, please, bold on both sides. The first, your first name and last initial, bold on both sides. And the reason for both sides is you obviously see how much you personally do. I want to make sure the people behind you. Um, can still reference you in the event that, you know, hey, well, I don't want people to say, you know, like, well, what she said, I want to be what Sharon said. So, please write your name, big bold, A, so I can see it from this bar. And it be, so people can see it behind you. And then, um, right on the bottom corner, again, please fold these lengthwise hot dog. Then on the bottom corner, just one side, write world history, 3 p.m., in the event that you accidentally leave it here, then I know which class that I didn't bring it back to. So you only need to do it on one side, bottom right hand corner. So thank you very much. Also, if you are the creative type and you want to color on it, make your name more flashy, add some frills to it of any kind, go right ahead. That's totally fine. So, make it your own. So you can go ahead and do All right, so, what say you? Who has like a really strong pin? Is selfishness evil? Uh, I would say it depends on what you're doing because, like, I don't think selfishness and evil all things inherently, like, they don't, they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Like, if you were to, like, uh, well, we, we were talking right up against the point that if he does not eat a full meal and then he pulled out a snack and I asked him for something, he said no, that wouldn't be evil because he needs to also protect himself. Okay, but is it is, is survival selfish? I mean, so what you're so I just want to clarify. So you're saying like you just ate a full meal. He has just a little snack, and he is Luke has just now I know Luke has just a little snack, and then you ask, and that's all his food. If he gives up his food, obviously that is selfless on his part. But if it leads to potentially him dying. Or falling ill, it wasn't selfish on his part to give it up. That's a little bit of gray area that I wasn't expecting. I think it's a very fascinating philosophical question. I'm just trying to work that out in my head. Okay. Is so continue. Is selfishness even? Yeah. I would say yes. Um, I adhere to the uh, Bible. So it specifically says that selfishness is sin, sin. By that definition from there, uh, evil is sinful. Mm -hmm. And so I would say selfishness is sinful. But to that same point, uh, I was thinking just like you know, uh, my boss said we have to take care of our bodies, take care of our 
results. Now we we'll pass on that result. Yeah. And that is, that is the one, that's the kind of gray area that I get stuck in in regards to, you know, but if Ian is, excuse me, if Luke has died and you ask him for food. Okay, so I'll, I'll say this. I'll actually say that it's selfish on Ian's part for asking. Because he did just have a full meal. He is going to be okay. Luke is the hungry one. If he then asks Luke for some of his food, knowing that's going to potentially hurt Luke, and that's the selfish person, no offense, as we're speaking strictly your analogy, then Ian becomes the selfish one. Therefore, selfishness, wouldn't, wouldn't that be Ian? Yeah. Um, I was thinking, like, you're talking a little bit about selfishness versus people, but isn't there, like, a core of selfishness versus people? So, like, in that yes. situation that they're talking about, I think that him selfishly asking for food is a people, but he so like stuff like that where it's like you're being selfish leads to like greediness and like some other things that is greediness selfish? I don't know. I never think of like like seven cents or whatever. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. But, I don't know. It's a good idea. It's a good thought. That's what I'm happy. Sarah. It also like talks about like say you're breaking up with someone or like trying to cut off a friend because they're toxic, sometimes you just have to think about yourself in that situation and your well being. And it's not necessarily selfish because you like have to get out of that. Well then if it's not necessarily selfish, then is it selfish at all? I mean if a person is bad for you, it's not selfish of you to stay with them because it's not selfish of you to take abuse. It's selfish of them to abuse you and therefore and in an instance, whether it's verbally or physically or emotionally, it's selfish on their part for abusing you and not treating you as an equal. And I couldn't imagine why it would be selfish on your part. I mean, Ian did bring up the point that maybe there could be some gray or sin there, and maybe I could conceive of something where we could kind of go through that. But I would just say, you know, generally speaking, if a person is, if it's a, as you were in a toxic relationship, it could be, and it's, the toxicity is coming from your opposite. You know, your opposite. Um, I can't imagine why that would be selfish on your part of staying. It would be selfish, like Ian's character asking for food from Luke. It would be selfish on, no offense, Hayden's character being toxic for Sierra's character. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's fun. Uh, I guess I'd say that. I love people, having these titles. I cannot say our names. It isn't manly people, but it could also bring, it, it could also uh, create good acts. Like an example, selfishness like, can create good acts. Yeah, the way I view it is, uh, take an example: somebody that's really rich and simply just has a lot of money to throw around, and he just wants his name on a building. So he writes a um, public library just so he can have his name in the library. It ends up helping the community, but it, at the end of the day, it's a selfish act. Okay, so if at the end of the day, it's a selfish act, regardless of helping people, is that still not you? I'd say it. Leads to a better community, so that it wouldn't be inherently evil. Well, I, guess I think inherently evil and um, actively evil are two different things. But in the end, if the modus is it modus operandi, if that is the motive, that's the is selfish, then can okay. Well, then I think the question is. Can good things still come from selfish acts? Yeah. Which is what you're illustrating. Whether it's just, you know, possibly. But regardless, is that selfishness still evil on its surface? If the only reason for the good act was for celebration, it still is that is that selfishness, and I'll ask. And if it is, then if by definition, it is that it's still evil. I wouldn't say it's evil just to want your name on a building. I wouldn't say that's like it's evil. Okay, it, it, you can see that it's not necessarily evil for wanting a name on a building. Well, I see it's a person that establishes selfishness in itself, the, not the outward selfishness, but the selfishness in itself is evil. Yeah. And then you determine whether or not the outward is, regardless of the name on a table or a name on a library or something. Yeah, yeah, I like that perspective. I love, I do love though that this conversation can take on so many different variations. Because not only there's obviously there's 
20 together. So, so there's 20 different perspectives. But then there's also 20 different ways of looking. And that provides us with a very, with a vibrant, you know, a, a vibrant uh, response. So I do enjoy that. Anybody else? I don't see. Is it very evil, especially if you go up the definitions? Say so, what? Well, so I don't think it's a very evil, especially if you go up the, I'm kind of going up the definitions of it. Um, you can look at it in a negative connotation, saying that like, going for yourself without regard to other people. But it's like, just in my experience, I'm the kind of person that will give more of myself out to others and you know, help other people. You know, go the extra mile and stuff. Sure. But there comes a point where you kind of have to just not do that and focus on yourself, focus on others and yourself. And yeah. And that is a selfish act in itself by focusing on yourself, not thinking about other people. But it's not necessarily a crime. Yeah. Well, even Jesus slept. Right. You know, he could hypothetically have been out helping people even in the middle of the night, even he took rests. You know, Basil even illustrated. I mean, the Bible, while the Bible says that, that sin is evil, it also says you must take care of your body. So, you know, is it to that context then, is it selfish to put a time limit on the amount of help you can do? And let's just say, the sake of argument, you said, I can only help people for eight hours a day. Was that selfish? Because, you know, you probably could have been not. But you just set a number and said, I'm going to help you for eight hours a day. You know, and the thing is, is that, and it kind of, again, it goes back to Ian and Luke's characters in that, you know, you're being selfless by helping people. And then you're thinking of yourself going, I can do it right hours a day because I still have to spend time with my family. I'm still going to go home and rest. I'm still going to go, you know, eat and sleep and so forth. Therefore, is it not selfish on other people saying, well, you know, can you help me after hours? Well, no, I, I got to care for myself as well. I'm giving you eight hours a day, even seven days a week. You know, so is it not that selfish for a person to call for a ninth hour or tenth hour? Is that more selfish than you putting a limit and not giving nine hours or ten hours versus that eight where you fairly said you came to your personal conclusion like I could totally help you for eight hours a day? You know? I think it agrees to be selfish, but it, it, which part is selfish? Like all, all of it. I mean it's definitely self it, it's a selfish act, but it, to put a limit on your on your time? Sure. And for people to ask for but is it evil? Because they need the help and they need the help. But it's, you know, they're they're inherently being selfish, but they're not inherently being selfish. Okay. Like I said, I love the Bible to see this all. I do wonder though, if it is at all selfish putting a time limit on yourself. Because hypothetically, then by your definition, if you're not giving all of yourself for 24 hours a day, then you are being selfish. And if you were to do that, you would die that week. Right. So then what was the purpose of your efforts? If they were that limited. So I I don't really see how that in itself could be selfish simply because you still need to survive yourself. And if you don't survive, then you can't help anybody. And all those people who could have got your help on day eight, but now can't because you died after day seven, now they're left without you. And hate them will end so that we can kind of get the context. No, no, go on. I want to hear it. I think there's a difference between acting in your self-interest and then in selfish things. So like up there it says obsessively and exclusively with oneself. And I think that acting in your best self-interest doesn't mean you're excessively able to do something you just from the thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that like it's just the balance of that, like doing what's good for you sure. is it always good for you. Well then let's look at it from a, a very dramatic stark contrast, and this is how we'll we'll uh, transition. Is it selfish to steal a dog? So is it selfish to steal one dog? Just one dollar. You see a dollar on, on your neighbor's desk and you just go. Okay. Is it evil to steal one dog? Hey, a dollar. Okay. So is it selfish to steal a million dollars? Funnel it out of this company. They don't know it's missing. You're doing it one penny at a time, like office space, or whatever. Is it selfish to steal a million dollars? Is it therefore evil to steal a million dollars? If it is selfish. 
if they are both evil, then are they evil at different levels, or is the simple act the same? If it was evil to steal a dollar from your neighbor, and it's evil to steal a million dollars from a company, is the act of selfishness thus not equally evil? Because the intent was still the same. Make sense? Selfishness is evil. Regardless of the size and scope, regardless of who is being hurt, if nobody, I mean, think about it, billion dollar corporation, you funneled a million dollars out, are they getting hurt? No. And let's say, you know, we stole from Michaela, that was her dinner money, is that one dollar? They're still equally as evil. The act is evil, regardless of the size and scope. So, let's transition here. This is freaking me out that it's not working. I don't want this thing to skip. Okay. So I need to preface this next slide with a papal bull. <laughs> what is a papal bull? So a papal bull is actually basically a stamp or a seal made out of lead. Um, and it's a particular type of patent or charter issued by a pope of the Catholic Church. It is named after the lead seal, which in Latin is bulla, uh, that was append uh, appended to the end of a letter uh, in order to authenticate. This was a lead bulla that only a pope had access to. So that way, when he put forth a letter of any kind, he would seal it with wax with his papal, pope papal bull, bulla seal, and boom, that meant it was his. So the reason why I illustrate this is because next slide there's going to reference the papal bull. Now you not only know what it is, but you actually can see it. So we're going to start with the Reformation. So in Pope Leo X, Papa Bull of 1520, he said, quote, Arise, O Lord, and judge thy cause. A wild boar has invaded thy vineyard. Arise, O Peter, and consider the case of the Holy Roman Church, the mother of all churches, consecrated by thy blood. Arise, O Paul who by thy teaching and death hast illuminated and dost illumine the church. Arise, all ye saints, and the whole universal church, whose interpretations of scripture has been assailed or called into question, when it never had been in the first 1,520 years of the church before. Martin Luther's response in here, like, quote, It truly seems to me, that if this fury of the Romanists should continue, the Roman Catholics should continue, which of uh, which he was, there is no remedy except that the emperor, kings, and princes, girded with force and arms, should resolve to attack this plague of all the earth, no longer with words, but with the sword. So it's literally calling for war against the Catholic Church. If we punish thieves with the gallows, robbers with the sword, and heretics with fire, why do we not all the more fling ourselves with all our weapons upon these masters of perdition, these cardinals, these popes, and all this sink of Roman sodomy that ceaselessly corrupts the church of God and wash our hands in their blood so that we may free ourselves and all who belong to us from this most dangerous fire that being hell. So it was this argument that led to the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther questioning some practices of the Catholic Church, the way they interpreted certain aspects of the faith and so forth, and the church's vehement response towards him and his followers. Oh gosh, it's scary. Good. Stop, 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 stop. Okay. okay. So the Protestant Reformation uh, challenged the established authority of the church, which had never happened before. Certainly, I mean, I, I will say there's been very many challenges to folks in the past. There was one point in the uh, history of folks that there were two folks at one time, but um, it's a, a much different story. But this is the most challenge, the greatest challenge that the church had ever felt against its established authority uh, and the Protestant Reformation secured the triumph of secular power, that of non 
church, uh, non members of the church, able to uh, rule over people who chose the first time. It shaped the identities and changed the map of Europe in a very tremendous way. It contributed to centuries of violent conflict, generally and traditionally, between Catholics and Protestants, and it contributed to the ascendancy of individualism, which at least the United States can look at as a blessing, because it was this ascendancy of individualism that led um, colonists to question the Protestant churches um, in the seven, early 1700s, and which then led them to question the power of the king, uh, which led us to the American Revolution. So, who was Martin Luther? Martin Luther is known, well, first off, was a German Augustinian monk uh, who taught at the University of Whitman. So he was a Roman Catholic, as all Christians were. Up until the Protestant Reformation, if you were Christian, you were Catholic, that was Christ's church. And Catholic actually is defined as universal. Um, he is known as an accidental revolutionary because his revolution created a, a gave way to new thoughts and interpretations in Christ and in church and how one would celebrate uh, Christ, uh, which was at least initially by no means his intention. The reason it is so, the reason for the phrase Protestant Reformation, Protestant simply meant you're protesting, you're questioning. Reformation. He was attempting to reform the church. He wasn't attempting to destroy the church. He, church. he wasn't attempting initially to create a schism. He certainly initially was not attempting to form new denominations of the faith. He was simply trying to clean up a mess that he saw and brought it to the attention of the church. So in 1517, they called to the church to the followers. In 1517, Luther felt so compelled to speak up against these papal abuses, these abuses by the Pope and the authorities. Um, in particular, Pope Leo X was using the sale of indulgences to build a new church of St. Peter. So what is an adult indulgence? It's, a, it's quite simple, actually. Uh, it is a payment on the penalty of sin. But it's a monetary payment on the penalty of sin. And so priests or penitents uh, would work to sanctify uh, them, their souls from their mortal deadly sin. So uh, there are mortal sins and there are venial sins. A venial sin is, well, excuse me, I'll say this. A mortal sin is when you take yourself completely away from Christ. You, it's really when you commit one of the seven deadly sins, hence the, the mortal or deadly. Um, those are instances in which you fully separate yourselves from Christ. And some of the most common, I would say, uh, are acts of uh, in like premarital sex, uh, pornography, rape, uh, molestation, um, and really, any of those what are called sins of flesh, those are the truly mortal and unless repentant upon, you place yourself in a position of hell upon death. Um, so you work to sanctify your soul. And when it's one is in, in the Catholic faith, you go to confession, you speak to a priest, and you offer a sincere and honest confession. And you can, uh, as the confessor, excuse me, and, and in that moment, the priest um, has the ability to absolve you of your sins. He does not absolve you of of you know, eternal punishment. He, he can, he, a priest does not say, you know, clean, you're safe, you're good. If you die right now, you're going to heaven. He's like, no, but your sins are forgiven on earth. You may move on with a clean and clear conscience so long as you also hold firm to not commit those sins again. Because sometimes, certainly, like things like uh, pornography, I mean, you have a tendency to continue with those as they tend to be addictive. So a priest will be like, okay, absolving you of that mortal deadly sin. Can, can leave the clear conscience, but it only really holds kind of effect on your soul if you make a point to not do it again. Um, you obviously can, can slip up, it's not like that. Just like, hey, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I, you know, I've, seen a, I've been looking at porn. And then the priest goes, okay, but it's all done. What's the first thing you do? You know, like, and then really, really, you know, truly speaking with a clear heart. Well, according to medieval theology, after a priest uh, absolved a penitent, the, the confessor's guilt, the penitent still remained under eternal punishment, a punishment God justly opposed to that sin. Well, once absolved through confession, that eternal penalty was reduced to a manageable work of salvation, a 
according to the church this time, that the penitent I perform here and now, like prayer, fasting, alms, going, and pilgrimages. Well, one thing that you do after confession is the priest will assign you with um, some form of prayer. You know, really, this is just a, okay, you are absolved. You can be free of guilt. You have spoken. You have intent to clean your life. You have intent to abolish, you know, the practice of these sins. Now, you know, you kind of close it out with the saying of certain prayers, and the priest will assign it to you. I mean, it could literally be as simple as reading a passage from the Bible that is similar to the sins that you committed. It really just kind of brings you closer to say the gospel, or it's, you know, saying an Our Father, or a couple of Hail Marys, or, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it just kind of closes it up. Well, what the church was doing at this time is they were actually assigning uh, time values to sins in hell, saying, or purgatory, saying, you're going to spend this much time for those sins. However, if you give us money, we'll wipe out, we can wipe out some of that. And so depending upon the sins, some some priests were give where they actually, at some point, some people had calculated it out, saying, okay, you can, depending on these sins, you can spend 1,412 years in, in hell or, or in purgatory. But if you give us this much money, we can wipe that out. Well, then people are going broke. The church in, in one area, by the way, this was not universal. It was just in, in one area in Rome. The church was kind of cleaning people out of their money. And so one the famous indulgence peddler, Johann Tetzel, who had been authorized by Pope Leo X to sell uh, indulgences, spoke like a carnival barker or concession uh, concessioner working the aisle of a baseball game Stating, as soon as a coin of the copper rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Which meant you can also pay for people to get out of purgatory. You can actually give money to get them out. So it was, it was kind of a wacky mess here that they had going on. Thus, many people suffered as a result of these indulgences because they were being melt dry, not only for paying for their own sins, but then they could potentially pay for those who were supposedly um, to be in purgatory for the sins that they committed here on earth. So, enticed by the idea of a quicker avenue into heaven, the poor were encouraged to spend money on a religious luxury that they obviously could not afford. So, each of the early reformers, again, it's all people like Martin Luther were trying to do. They're trying to reform, they're trying to clean, they're not trying to break. Um, each of the early reformers faced opposition from both the church as well as secular rulers and even secular kings, uh, and even their own communities. Because what they were kind of calling out was the leadership of the church and really calling them out in very strong terms, ways that have never been done. The initial skepticism of these groups quickly gave way to more hostile reactions, which included excommunication. So an excommunication is that you have placed yourself in, okay, so if you're not Catholic, uh, communion is the body and blood of Christ. It becomes the body, body and blood of Christ through transubstantiation in the moment of the reenactment of the Last Supper. Well, when you ingest it, you are, as Christ said at the Last Supper, ingesting the body and blood of Christ. And you have to be in a position of grace to receive it. Um, Christ even says it that you, you need to be in a place of grace. You cannot be in a state of mortal sin or receive it. Otherwise, you're actually compounding because now you're literally placing the body of God into a body of, of true mortal imperfection. Um, so when you are excommunicated, it means that you are not allowed to receive communion until you have um, confessed your sins, your, your mortal sins. So some of the, what, you're, you're still as you know you're still supposed to go to mass. You're supposed to go to church on Sundays, and that's one of the ten commandments. It's not like you're you're out of church. It's just that you have separated yourself from God, and thus the priest cannot give you. You cannot receive communion until you have confessed your sins, accepted you know the penance, and done the penance, and then you are now in a state of grace, which is a place for God to reside. So some of the reactions are a little bit more hostile, like excommunication being shunned, or even in some extreme, extreme cases, being put to death. Financing their moves, their, their movements, was also an issue. They required patronage of a state or a national ruler to back their cause, which is also a big deal. The money that was needed falls for them to push 
any sort of movement to get a strong change of course, of course, the church to change was expensive. So, how did this all come down? Well, Luther posted his 95 Thesis on October 31st, 1517, on the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, which, of course, he um, was a uh, professor at the University of Wittenberg. He protested the impression that indulgences actually remitted or forgave sins and released the dead from punishment and purgatory. Luther believed that such claims turned salvation into something that could be bought and sold. And he said on this quote, If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point at which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing him. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And so in this case, he's saying the soldier of a Christian, a Christian soldier, that fighting, willing to die a martyr for Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all battlefields besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. In other words, he's like, I have set these battle lines. The church is now at war with me. I am not a soldier of Christ unless I fight through to the end. If I flinch now, any question of, you know, of my loyalty to Christ is gone because I'm willing to give in to these human flawed um, perceptions and perspectives, excuse me. So thus the selling of indulgences was the trigger for Martin Luther's open defiance of the teaching of the church. His purpose was simply to contrast, to draw a contrast with the Bible's teaching with what the church was currently requiring. His 95 Thesis, and I think it's in 95 points, uh, his 95 Thesis can be summarized into two aspects. One, the sale of indulgences was exploitative of the economy of the German nation. Luther accused the Pope of building St. Peter's uh, Basilica out of the, quote, skin, flesh, and bones of his sheep. And two, the Pope had no authority over purgatory, and even if he did, forcing people to pay their way out was too contrary to Christian charity. Luther's, uh, Luther not only challenged the doctrine of indulgences, but the whole sacred conception of salvation. At first, Pope Leo initially saw the 95 Theses as the dispute between Augustine and monks, and basically ignored it. This was, as he saw, a simple theological argument to clergy, something that happened and happens to this day. It was an in-house debate, not even worth the Pope's time. Soon, though, however, Leo was forced to not hold back. On June 15, 1520, he issued a papal decree condemning Luther as a heretic, meaning that he could die for those sins. Luther defied the Pope and continued his crusade of reformation. This simple goal, more than just a protest against the Pope, it would be a positive and constructive renewal of the church, which again goes back to why he is called an accidental revolutionary. He had no intention of creating anything new outside of what he could create within the Catholic Church. Which leads us to now the war is on, the two sides have become entrenched, the Diet of Worms in 1521. It absolutely has nothing to do with Worms. Um, Diet was an imperial council, and Worms in this case was actually a place in Germany. So it's just by chance a weird sounding place, a real weird sounding thing. Um, but it really could just be Council of Phoenix. Like we wouldn't think anything odd of Council of Phoenix. So the council spread out Luther's writings to the imperial chamber. Luther was a prolific writer. There was such a pile that Charles V and his aides expressed even doubt as to whether any single person could have written so much. Luther was asked publicly to recant if he had done that and to confess his mistakes about the gospel, the nature of the church, and the current state of Christendom. If he had done that, he would have been placed back into communion with Christ and the body, therefore 
to the receiver hand, it would have been a holy member and holy as a WHLY member, an active member of the church. But after a day of deliberation, he said, Therefore, I ask by the mercy of God, may your most serene majesty, most illustrious lordships, and anyone at all who is able, either high or low, bear witness, expose my errors, outthrowing them by the writings of prophets, prophets and the evangelists. Once I have been taught, I shall be quite ready to renounce every error. And I shall be the first to cast my books into the fire. Basically, he's saying, I'm right, you're wrong, suck it. He had no intention of recanting anything that he believed and had written. The emperor uh, spokesman uh, pressed him further, to which replied, quote, Since then, your serene majesty and your lordships seek a simple answer, I will give it in this manner neither horns nor tooth, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known they have often erred and contradict themselves. I am bound by the scriptures, I am quoted, and my conscience is held captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything, since it is neither safe no right to go against conscience. And finally he added, Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Luther, of course, had no intention of breaking off from the church. He was merely standing firm on his position of the Pope and um, upper leadership's errors in their own interpretations. Luther firmly believed that nothing good could have been achieved through schism. But regrettably, his excommunication in 1520 and his further ultimate uh, condemnation at this Diet of Worms in 1521 ruled out any possibility of reconciliation. So, what say you? Why do you think some secular rulers, kings, secular just simply means they're not rulers of the church. So obviously like a pope is not a secular ruler, he's, he's a religious ruler, but you know, a president is a secular ruler, even if the president is religious. Why do you think some secular rulers or kings opposed challenging the pope? Would have been happened less than 200 years prior to decimating a huge portion of the European population whose echoes surely lived on and that on occasion solely popped up here and there in smaller doses leaving people in a constant state of awareness of potential clerics, all of which absolutely played a role in people willing to sacrifice every penny possible to help sell their soul, save their soul and buy eternal salvation while still on earth. Social distance talk to your neighbors. <laughs> I'm just going to get a drink of water real quick. <laughs> Tasting. There's no dirt, chlorine flavor. Like, I live in Glendale, but I'm too far from Glendale over a couple months. I live in Glendale, the Glendale tap water is just disgusting. This water is good. Is it just, am I crazy or am I really just that thirsty that I could drink dirt water or taste one? It's not good. 
Washington water is like. Well, okay, so I'm not saying it's the best. Yeah, I, okay, so I'll have a print then that I don't have the best water retention reference. But, so Washington Tap is really good. Do you know where they pull it from? Uh, but do you know where that water comes from? Like snow melt. There's a it's okay, so it's like melt. Okay. So I wonder, is it from like Flagstaff, Prescott area? I'm just curious, like, curious if like Flagstaff and Prescott waters are much better. I have said Glendale water is just dirt. It's just so gross, but this is pretty good. Well water. Well water is fantastic. Water. Yeah. So my sister and brother in law, they live. In an unincorporated part of north, it's north of Surprise, it's Whitman, and they're all well water. It is very good. It's very good. With no chemicals, it's just straight up fresh. All right, well, maybe that's just me. I just I drank that water, I'm like, I need something. And probably, I'll, I'll grant this, this is my last little point. Probably tastes gross from more. The coal does help kind of mask, but that's the thing, it's the perfect temperature, too. It's the, Perfect cold. This is not too cold. Just don't chug it. It's fantastic. Yeah. So what event? Or excuse, well, first off, let's go with B. What event am I referencing here? What happened two years prior that they still worried about? Two hundred years prior that they still worried about to this day. By this day, I'm in the fifteen twenties. Black plague. Yeah, the black plague. Can't. I mean, remember this when we discussed this? We were still on Zoom about our call card. Um. 25%, approximately 25% of Europe was wiped, wiped out. I imagine that. If 25% of the American population was wiped out because of COVID, it, it'd be Armageddon. I mean, because we're talking 25% of 30, so 35 would be 10%, 70 would be 20%, 70, 83, 80, it'd be approximately 83 to 85 million people dead. By the way, four to five years, we're talking 80 million plus Americans dead. But Equivocate, equivocate to the 25 percent ish. And it was somewhere between 25 and 33 percent of Europe. That's a ridiculous number. And then consider, too, how in some places in Europe, some towns were wiped out to the tune of 70 percent, meaning three out of every 10 people that survived, or excuse me, three out of every 10 people before the plague survived. That's, I mean, it's ungodly. I'm going to agree. 6, 9, 12, 13, 14. So we're, we're talking. 10, 10 of us dead in this room? I mean, it's just like, that's insane. And so the echoes of which they were still living with. The world, the European world, was much better after the plague because there was far less starvation because there was now a tremendous surplus of food, cleaner water, better air. I mean, it really did help the living. They had to survive such a horrific cataclysmic event, but it really did help. But it still scared the crap out of so, why then would some secular leaders be opposed to challenging the Pope? Yeah. Who do you think is going to kings were afraid of the of God's wrath? Basically, that if he were if this king were to oppose the Pope, God would somehow somehow take it up on them. You know, and like I think. These kings were afraid that if they were to speak up against the Pope, they'd be speaking up against the Pope. Okay, so the second half of that is more correct than the first half. So yes, if you're speaking up against the Pope, then you are speaking up against God to a degree. Although a lot of these kings were left on the foundation of divine right of kings anyway, so they were, you know, if you questioned them, you were questioning God. So it's a little palpable there. The thing of when, when God taken out of them, that's really never been a Christian perspective that if you do something God, you know, especially on a societal level, that that's my vote. Obviously we have um Sodom and Gomorrah, but if, even if, if we were to use the fifteen hundreds as modern sense, that you know, you know if we look at them in a modern context, that really wasn't something that Christians were really worried about. Um, it it extended and I'm not so what I'll I'll sidebar to say I cannot speak to the fact that maybe some of them had that inkling. Possibly. It's just more unlikely. It's certainly it's, it's to a lesser extent than Hayden's answer. Yeah. I, well, this might not be right. But I was thinking, like, uh, complacency might be a factor because this is obviously mentioning them. They're not convinced they're actually they're suffering from the same thing. 
So I was thinking more like when people that are actually taking money from the body from and like when they're working out like you were saying, those are the people that I would expect to kind of like move hold instead of maybe answers. Well yeah, because remember if you guys uh, did martial arts on Tuesday, remember that um, a pope could influence a king. The, the pope was the only person who had power over a king. So if the kings revolted, then hypothetically, at this point, then there were no secondary denominations yet, a pope could kick a king out of office, keep their power. Um, so that, to a degree, would have a little bit contemplate this, though. If the pope was milking dry the people of the king, now the king can't milk them dry. So you could kind of see like a conflict there, but the king's like, they don't have, you can't, you're taxing them yourself for everything. They've got, how am I supposed to tax? I can't keep up my kingdom without their money. So last one, and I'll, and I'll bring it back. I, think I'll, I want to hear it as well, not exactly how I am, but I do want us to kind of contemplate. The reason I have this secondary example is because we're speaking to the citizens here. So we are speaking to the citizens here specifically. That's one. Could it be that it has to do with legitimacy? Since the kings basically derive their uh, divinity from the Pope. So if they basically rebel, then the Pope can basically take away their. Yeah, so that's totally going on the perspective. And so yes, so there there would be some truth to that from a from a, you know the, the leadership level from the government in terms of monarchy. But if we're thinking back though to all these people that died, remember what was the purpose of these indulgences? It was to save people's souls. So why might the Pope, why not, might the kings not uh, confront the Pope? Then you're like a king that doesn't want his people to be saved. Yeah, you're, you're essentially, exactly. You're taking away what is the currently accepted method of getting out of hell. Of getting a purgatory and going straight to heaven. So, in essence, they don't want to question the Pope because who are they as secular leaders to decide how one gets to heaven? They're being told by the one person who actually stands above them in power and authority on this earth that this is a workable method. And they were doing it for years. It's not like they just popped up one summer. Mark would look around and what's going on? This has been going on for many years um, and was becoming a fairly established method of, of salvation. So who are these secular kings to now question the Pope? They don't have the kind of intuition on so They certainly don't necessarily have the kind of um, clerical learnedness to be able to say, well, no, Pope, you're wrong. And then if they, you know, you're, gonna, you're killing, you're, you're, you're hurting the souls or, or um, risking the souls of my, my people, well, then at the same time, going back to Esteban and Hayden's perspective, then on top of that, well, if I do question myself, I, you know, he's the only person who can actually kind of oust me from power myself. Very good, all, all of you guys. All right, so what began as an attempt to simply reform the practices of the Catholic Church evolved flatly in Pope Pius III. Performers were met with often violent reactions from church and secular leaders and citizens alike. The desire for reform evolved into a fight for freedom, and in some parts of Europe, even armed rebellion. And, you know, I mean, just think about how strongly, if, if you yourself are a passionate Christian, just think about how passionate you are about your faith. And think about, too, uh, how firm you feel in your practices. And if somebody questions it, you know, it might not lead you to a reaction of, of you know, physical fighting. But it is probably going to lead to a reaction in your head of defense, right? You're going to want to defend your faith. Well, we're now at a point where people are literally saying the church being almost literally torn apart, which has never happened before. And you can also then see this as being a fear that Satan himself is getting himself into these, this Christian flock and driving a wedge, and by doing so, dragging potentially millions of souls down into hell with them because they're pulling themselves out of Christ's universal church. Therefore, people are going to fight, and they're going to fight those in particular who are leading and egging on those potential new Protestant followers because they're like, 
don't steal these souls. So the Reformation takes on several different forms. You have Martin Luther, who is looking to flatly reform the church, ends up being excommunicated, leaves the church, starts a new denomination with all of his new followers, and within months gets married to this other one. Four months of him going, okay, I, I'm gone. I, gotta, I need to start a new clean denomination as he saw it. He meets this girl. He was 41. She was 29. They fall in love. Four months later, he's married. Well, then, again, so that's one form of the Protestant Reformation. Another form is in England. The most impressive example of an expansion of power, not just an expansion of waistbands, who, um, by a Reformation monarch, is that of King Henry VIII in England. Henry's desire for a male heir at the throne led to a complete break with the Roman Catholic Church when it, the church, rejected his uh, marriage and annulment petition. So, in, in the Catholic faith, you cannot get a divorce. It's very, very strict and straightforward. Marriage is a sacrament, a covenant of not just two, but three. It is you, you your spouse, and God. You are forming a relationship that emulates the Holy Family, the Trinity, uh, that you cannot break. You enter those that relationship with a vow as a priest vow of celibacy, you vow devotion to your spouse, both husband to wife and wife to, to husband. And therefore, if you come to some troubles, well, you better daggone figure it out because you're not allowed to divorce. Because if you're divorcing, now you're splitting God up and it's just physically not possible. Well, the church does allow an annulment. Annulments are generally traditionally rare. But essentially, how an annulment can, can occur is when it is proven down the line that one partner of the two uh, entered the relationship under severe and serious, you know, with, with severe and serious lies behind. It. You know, and, and one very simple example is that one person says, you know, I'll marry you and I'll become Catholic. Then you get married. And that person who wasn't Catholic goes, screw that, I don't want to be Catholic, you know, I don't want to do that. Well, that's grounds for an annulment because the partner entered that marriage with the expectation that her or his partner was going to convert. In this case, King Henry VIII is just wanting a boy. That ain't on the church. That's on him and his wife. If you don't have a boy, figure it out. So he petitions the church, knowing he can't get divorced, he petitions the church for an annulment. Get me out of this thing so I can go find somebody else who actually give me a boy. Well, the Pope said, no, like, that's not how it works. We take this, this whole marriage thing really serious here. So because the Reformation had taken place, because a single monk had proven anybody could start a new denomination, King Henry VIII said, deuces, I'm out. And the Parliament followed suit. So in 1534, the English Act of Supremacy was passed, and I'll just read it. Albeit the king's majesty justfully, justly, and rightfully is and ought to be the supreme head of the Church of England, and so is recognized by the clergy of this realm in their convocations, yet nevertheless, for cooperation and confirmation thereof, and for increase of virtue and Christ's religion within this realm of England, and to repress and extirp all errors, heresies, and other enormities and abuses heretofore used in the same. Be it enacted, that is one long sentence, be it enacted by authority of this present parliament that the king, our sovereign lord, his heirs and successors, kings of this realm, shall be taken, accepted, and reputed the only supreme head in earth of the Church of England called Anglicana Ecclesia. So right there, the Church of England is formed simply because the king wanted a divorce and the Pope would give it, and the Parliament gave them all power over faith. And all priests and nuns of, uh, of the Catholic Church in England were now to be Anglican, and all citizens of England to become Anglican simply because the king is justly, rightfully, and is ought to be the supreme head of the, well, of the realm. 
um, what was the other one? Um, that the king, our sovereign lord, like all because he wanted to get divorced. So, what did his family tree look like? He first was married to Catherine of Aragon. Uh, the marriage was old because he annulled it of the Church of England. Uh, she died while detained under guard at Kimpton Castle. She is the mother of Mary the First. Then Anne Boylan, or Bolian, uh, her that marriage was also annulled, and then she was beheaded. Uh, she was the mother of Elizabeth the First, who's really having trouble here. Then Jane Seymour did, died, excuse me, 12 days after giving birth to Edward VI, and her death is believed to be uh, caused by birth complications. So at least now he had his heir, but he's also free to marry again. So he does. Anne of Cleves, their marriage was annulled. Uh, she never gave birth. However, she outlived the rest of the wives. And then sixth, Patrick, oh, Patrick Catherine Parr, who was widowed at the death of Henry VIII, uh, and remarried ultimately to Thomas Seymour. So six wives, one boy, and a whole new church, just so he could have that boy. So the Church of England was established by Henry to give the monarch control over all affairs of it. Um, an example of the subsequent loss of power by the monarch was Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. As a result of the Peace of Oxford in 1555, Charles surrendered, here we go, Charles surrendered the, his rights to choose the church of the German people. In addition, many of the newly converted Protestant monarchs enjoyed assuming control of Catholic church property and thus Catholic revenue, making them that much more powerful. So some of the effects of the Reformation on European nations. Uh, in France, those politically opposed to the throne aligned themselves with religious dissenters, known as the Huguenots. This led to a multi-year civil war all throughout France. Um, in England, as the offspring of Henry VIII struggled to control, for control of the throne, the new Church of England preserved through all those tumultuous times. Um, in Ireland, the English ruling class adopted the Church of England, while the Irish people remained predominantly Roman Catholic. The church, the, well, so actually, I need to go back to France real quick. France re remains a predominantly French, it's French, a uh, predominantly Catholic nation, although their participation in the faith is very, very minimal. Uh, Ireland remains predominantly Catholic. Uh, however, their, um, their liberal politics have really influenced the church in Ireland, and it's taken on a form, at least. The people are pretty much just ignoring the church entirely, so their, their participation is very minimal as well. So, consequences. This is the last bit. Consequences of the Protestant Reformation. One, it destroyed religious unity in Europe, which had been, a, Europe had been religiously unified for 1,500 years. Uh, again, if you were Christian up to this point, you were Catholic. That was the faith, the universal church. Two, it furthered the growth of modern secular and centralized states by strengthening monarchs at the expense of church bodies, um, which has led us to a much more secular world, um, meaning de-Christianized world. Three, it contributed to growth of political liberty, um, which at least the United States can thank, uh, because it obviously gave us the practice, it gave us the the impetus for individualism and controlling self-destiny of a nation, uh, primarily the First Great Awakening, which I discussed last week in U.S. history, two weeks in U.S. history, um, which then gave those colonists the impetus for revolution, which I think we can say for the most part has been a positive in this world. Four, it advanced the idea of equality. So for instance, Martin, for instance, Martin, Martin Luther held that there was no spiritual distinction between the laity and clergy. There was a spiritual equality of all believers. All were equally Christian. All were equally priests. In other words, they were all part of a priesthood of believers. Um, I don't know the, no, I don't quite know the history of this, but while there was at this time, obviously, kind of, you might look at popes and cardinals on a different level than the rest of, of the flock. This idea of inequality of spiritual distinction 
is no longer the case in the Catholic Church. I mean, obviously, the Pope and cardinals and bishops and priests, they hold very important roles, but um, the idea of inequality within the faith is just not a thing anymore. It has to be for as long as I, from what I know, for a very, very long time. Uh, for the contributing to the creation of individualistic ethic, again, um, something that the Protestants insist on the individual's rights and responsibility to interpret scripture according to the dictates of his or her conscience. Again, the United States can be, you know, can thank these people for this. And it may have contributed to the development of capitalist spirit as the Reformation stress, stress on individual conscience. Uh, because of the Reformation stress on individual conscience, conscience which underlies modern economic Life. So it initially strengthened the position of some monarchs and their theory of absolute authority because now they truly had absolute authority. They had political, economic, and now religious absolute authority. It also introduced the ideas of individualism and the notion that challenging authority when it was corrupt and despotic was, despotic was appropriate. Uh, it also results in the introduction of political theories the descent from an enlightenment thought, seeing the writings of Jean Jacques Rousseau, Jean Locke, Charles Montesquieu, and others. So let's look at our third assignment. Not new for like 10 days since he's 11 days. We'll give an extra day. Three parts, all very simple. First part, similar to the last assignment where you have a chart. So using the matrix below here, and again, this is just a downloadable doc. Use the matrix below to compare the views of uh, the thinkers listed regarding the source of political legitimacy and the rationale for obedience to government. Briefly describe the four thinkers listed on the source of political legitimacy and the rationale for obedience to government. Then select two thinkers of your choice and do the same. So it's very much kind of choose your own adventure. There's a number of, uh, there's hundreds of intellectual political thinkers. You have to write on these four and they're going to choose two more. You can make them modern older, whatever you want, all have to be just simply cited. So you'll just, for these six, source, you'll reference their source of political legitimacy and adhere their rationale for obedience to government. Um, presumably, you'll find the information in like the same spot So for each individual one. So just, you have to have one citation per row. So just make sure that you have one citation per row for all six. So that's the first part. Second and third part, questions are very simple. One, what is the purpose of government? Provide three different views from your matrix. You should pull from here to answer both of these. And identify the author of each view in your answer, three to five hundred words. And the two, why is political legitimacy important? Who or what provides a government with legitimacy? Who uh, use support from the matrix and course materials to answer that question? Three to five hundred words. And you're done. These boxes, I think, are 25 to 50 words. It's, it's short. It's just, you know, full answer, full answer, citation. Full answer, full answer, citation. These four, and then choose any two that you want. Make sense? Sound cool? Seriously, just take a couple minutes and find a couple of people that really interest you. I mean, you can think of feminist leaders. You can even think of like modern leaders. You can think of you know, you can go to ancients. You know, I've referenced a bunch more ancients. Um, we'll get into this, I think, a little bit more too to uh, help you fill out this matrix. I think on Thursday, it might be the Tuesday when I have to look, but you know, you'll get some of this. But then. You know, really have some fun, like find political thinkers that really speak to you. Uh, textbook is always going to be a lot of help. Here's the just sectional reading. It's just, just small digestible chunks, just portions of chapter 15, a couple of portions of 19. And then if you have any interest in what we've discussed today, a couple of books, movies, and documentaries, uh, three books, Here I Stand, A Life of Martin Luther, The Unintended Reformation, How a Religious Revolution Secularized, Secularized Society, and Heart of Europe, A History of the Home Holy Roman Empire. Documentaries, all I believe all three of these are on YouTube. Reformation, Europe's Holy War, Martin Luther, Driven to Defiance, and Luther, The Life and Legacy of the German Reformer. I take this I think this one you actually have to write. This one, I mean, they're all very good. And finally, movies, Luther, A Man for All Seasons. This one, the Academy Award for, Award for Best Pictures. Fantastic movie. And then the Seahawk. All right, let's take 10 y'all out. Any questions, comments, concerns, questions, questions about any of this? All right, good. Okay.
Uh, please keep your placards with you. Don't take those. I don't take them. And then, uh, Augustine. Here. Okay. Alani. Uh, Amir. Andre. Adam. Basil. Here. Basil. Bernice. Danielle. Destiny, Dylan, uh, Elijah, Esteban, Gabe, Hannah, Peyton, Peyton, Ian, Lisa, Jace, Johnny, Kelsey, Lauren, Lucas, Lucas, Holly, and then Luke. Lucas. Oh, I thought it was. Did I call you Luke or Lucas earlier? You called me Lucas, but my name, like Michael says, Luke. Your name where? My name, Michael says, Luke. Like my real name is Lucas. I go by Luke. God. Okay. Because we also, I also have a Luke, but he's in my other class. Okay. All right, Madison. Yeah. I'll buy you silver or gold. Silver. Madison, Michaela, Michaela, yeah. Mark, yeah. McKenna, yeah. Nicole, Sam, Sydney, Sierra, yeah. Sterling, Sydney Durrell, Talia, Zoe. Did I not call anybody? Any questions, comments, turn space, please, just poorly. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I love you all. Have a great weekend. I'll see you on, well, I guess I'll see you in person on Thursday. Uh, have a great weekend. Be safe, be healthy, and white coat at all costs. Like your mask. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to check if, if you've been uh, getting my emails for the classes.